Uh, welcome to our study. And uh, before we start, I want to uh, commit our time to the Lord and apply our indispensable principle, total reliance upon God's Holy Spirit. Did it work? Did I do it? I'm learning all this technology. Oh, but I forgot that. <laughs> I got yours done. But. All right. I'd like to share a verse from uh, Luke chapter 10. You're familiar with it. Verse 42. This one's not on the sheet. This is our indispensable principle. Uh, it's what our Lord Jesus said to Martha. One thing is needful. And I thought the one thing that was needful was Bible study. But the one thing that is needful is sitting at the feet of Jesus and letting Him teach the Bible. And so that's the needful thing, being taught of God, taught by the Lord. So I'm thankful that in some way He can use me as an instrument. You sit in front of me. But we're all sitting at the feet of Jesus. And only what He teaches us will make a difference. So let's just pray that the Lord would be our teacher and we'll look in the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the indwelling Holy Spirit, the One who discloses to us Christ and all the things of God and the things that pertain to our spiritual welfare. Open our eyes, we pray. Take the veil away that we might behold the Lord Jesus again in a fresh way. We commit our meditations unto you in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we are studying. Here comes Hurricane Kerry. All right. <laughs> We're studying the sixth judge that the Holy Spirit has put the spotlight on. Uh, it's not the sixth judge, but it's the sixth one that the Holy Spirit is calling attention to. In other words, we're looking at the last judge, Samson, chapters 13 to 16. I believe that God highlighted Samson as the final judge because he represents the whole book of Judges. In other words, he's a personal illustration of the nation. What they were doing as a nation, he did as an individual. Uh, Judges 13 and verse 1. The sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. That's the book of Judges. That's not just one illustration. Israel sinned, and then God turned them over to a foreign nation in order to discipline them. Uh, after a long period of chastening, verse 6, Judges 6.6, 6, Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. And so they sin, God chastens, then they cry to the Lord. And then chapter 2, verse 16, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those that plundered them. And then chapter 2, verse 18, when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. The Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. And so that was the fourfold cycle that's repeated six times in the book of Judges. They sinned, God chastened, they finally cried out for help, and then God raised up a judge and delivered them. Over and over, it's the same story. Now, what was the history of God's people became the history of Samson. He did exactly the same thing, over and over, and God continued to deliver. 
uh, the story of Samson is really divided into three episodes, three great segments of his life. The first segment, chapter 13, verse 24 and 25. The woman gave birth to a son, named him Samson. The child grew up, the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. And so, the story of Samson starts off well. He's born, he grows up, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, and God is working wonderful things through him. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how long that season lasted. and We have no indication of how old Samson was in any of these events in his life. We can assume that he's trying to get married and so on. We, can, we throw in an age, but we're, we're not, nobody is sure. But we know it lasted for some time. The Spirit of the Lord was on him, moved him, thrust him out, and worked through him. But then the second phase of his life begins in chapter 14, verse 3. His father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She looks good to me. And when he said, She looks good to me, he took his eyes off the Lord and he began to look away from the Lord, and everything went downhill for a long period of time. He went through a very rough season, until at the end, he did what Israel did. He cried to the Lord. Chapter 15, 18, and 19. We looked at this last week. He became very thirsty. He called to the Lord. And he said, You've given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant." And now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised. God split the hollow place that's in Lehi, so that water came out of it. And when he drank, his strength returned, and he revived. And so we see Samson takes his eyes off the Lord, lives a period, and then he finally cries out over and over again. We read, and I called attention to it last time. I don't want to reteach the lesson, but I want you to know that the idea of the Spirit of God constantly coming on Samson was not only to show the great patience of the Lord, but Samson, as a, an appointed deliverer from God, needed to know that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And every time he had a victory, he took credit for it. And every time we see it was the Spirit of God. It was not Samson. And God was determined to teach Samson. He was delivered from a lion. He was delivered from 30 Philistines. He was delivered from ropes and bondage. He was delivered from a thousand Philistines. And each time he took the credit and he thought the victory was in his own arms, his own legs, his thighs, his back, his muscles, even his hair. He thought the victory was in Samson. But we read, for example, 14, 5 and 6. Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother, came as far as the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that he tore him as one tears a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. We know how he had victory over the lion. Later on, he went back to gloat over what he thought was his own victory. But we see behind the scenes, it was the Spirit of God. And then in Judges fourteen nineteen. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. He went down to Ascalon and killed 30 of them, took their spoil, gave the changes of clothes to those who told the riddle. Once again, he thought he did it. 
But God lets us peek behind the scenes. The Spirit of God did it. And uh, it's always the Spirit of the Lord. Judges 15, 14, it's repeated again. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted as they met him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, so that the ropes that were on his arms were as flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds dropped from his hand. God was determined to teach him the truth of Zechariah 4, 6. Zechariah 4, 6 says, the word, This is the word of the Lord, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He didn't learn it until he faced an enemy that he couldn't deal with. And that was thirst. God put an enemy in front of him. And for the first time, he cries out to the Lord. And for the first time, he gives God the credit. And then he reached down and he took hold of that jawbone uh, of a donkey. And then that was just an instrument. He threw it down. And when he cried out to the Lord, God picked up the jawbone. I don't know how that, what that was, but it says God took it. I'd love to have seen how that happened. God took it. And God broke it open right where there was a hole for the tooth. The hollow, the Lehi, the hollow of the two. He broke it, and that jawbone was like the water in the rock. And water began to gush, and he drank, and, and he was delivered. So that was uh, the second stage of his life, and that lasted 20 years. Judges 15, verse 20. He judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistine. So he started off well, he took his eyes off the Lord, he finally looked back to the Lord, God delivered him, and that's where we left off. And now, this morning, we want to look at the third, the final, both the tragic and glorious end of Samson. Uh, the chapter begins with a repetition of the great weakness in Samson's life. And that great weakness, you know, was his attraction to pretty women. His attraction to the opposite sex. His passion. Uh, after 20 years looking to the Lord, we read chapter 16, 1. Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went in unto her. That was the beginning of stage 3. Now, I'm not going to tell the first part of this final season. That is the whole story of, of the harlot and the taking of the gates and so on. Because I want to get quickly to what will take up our whole time, Samson and Delilah. I'll return. I'm going to return uh, in sort of a summary of Samson's life, uh, Lord willing, next time. And we'll look a little bit at the fox's tails being tied together and we'll look at this particular incident. Uh, but once again, he's got his eyes off the Lord now, and he's back to his old mentality. And now he's starting to take credit again, and he thinks it's all up to him. And no matter what comes into his life, I can handle it. I have a willpower. I can say yes. I can say no. I'm God's man. He still knew. He was a Nazarite. We'll see that at the end. Uh, the main part of this last segment uh, segment took place after the harlot story. The harlot story just tells us he took his eyes off the Lord. All right? uh, and once again, God delivered him, and once again, he took credit and so on. But uh, I'm referring to Judges chapter 16, 4 through 31. So I'm jumping over that first story in order to get to this. You'll recognize this section and perhaps you're familiar with it, as the story of Samson and Delilah. Very, very famous story. This is his third issue with women. The first, you know, was a Phil Philistine woman he tried to marry. And that didn't work out, and she ended up dead, and her house was burned down with fire. 
The second was the harlot that we read at the beginning of this chapter. And now Delilah. She's neither a wife nor a harlot. She's just a woman that he moves in with. So this is more of an adultery situation. Uh, Judges 16.4, it came about he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, this is the end of the story of Samson, and as I suggested, it's both tragic and glorious. And I want us to see both parts. Uh, Delilah, because he had his eyes gouged out, (laughs) Delilah was the last woman he ever lusted after with the lust of the eyes. Uh, I want to tell you the story of Samson and Goliath, but my heart is not on Bible facts, because you can read, and you could get that on your own. So I have great truths, and I'm going to try to take the truths, because I want you to see the truth, and then weave the story into the truth. So that you end up at least with the truth. I think it'll, you'll end up with the story as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do is present four great spiritual illustrations that I see in the Samson and Delilah story. And they contain great spiritual messages, great spiritual truths. Now, I understand, I recognize, and I hope everybody, because I've been accused of the opposite of this, I hope everybody listening by tape understands, I'm not being allegorical. I'm not treating this as an epic story, a made-up story about a hero named Samson. Uh, This is not a fable. This is a real man. It really happened. It's literal. It's historical. It's actual. And I believe these facts took place, but I'm looking at it to illustrate these great spiritual realities. It's a sad story of a one-sided love affair and tremendous treachery. Uh, Tragic, I think, is too weak a word to describe the story of Samson and Delilah. But behind this history, the reason I believe the Holy Spirit has recorded it, is so that we could learn these great spiritual truths. So I'm going to attempt to present this in terms of these five pictures. The first picture is Delilah herself. She becomes a picture of something much bigger. The heathen damsel who betrayed Samson. And she did it for a price. Judges 14, or rather 16, 4 and 5. After this it came about, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him, see where his great strength lies, how we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will each give you eleven hundred pieces of silver. Now, it's not clear because of the Hebrew whether it was one price paid by five lords of 1,100 pieces of silver, or if each of the five lords gave 1,100 pieces of silver. The weight of most reliable commentaries think it was five times 100 and uh, 1,100. In other words, 5,500 pieces of silver. If you want to know how much that is, just remember Judas betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And Delilah is betraying Samson for 5,500 pieces of silver. There's a verse in the New Testament about Judas that I think perfectly illustrates Delilah. And it's Matthew 26, 48. Matthew 26, 48. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he's the one, seize him. Well, that's exactly Delilah's story. If you have read this story, 
Whoever I kiss sees him. And her, the whole purpose of her kiss was to capture uh, Samson. Delilah used her charms, her female embrace and kisses and sweet talk and body language and all the rest. Her pretended love, her tears. Uh, clearly the Holy Spirit lets us in behind the scenes. You know, as you read this, one wonders, at least I wonder, how blind and how stupid can somebody be uh, like Samson? Uh, Judges 16.6, Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength is and how you may be bound to afflict you. (laughs) Yeah, I'm about to drop that little coin. (laughs) <laughs> she spells it out. She wants to know so he can be put in bondage. He is playing with fire. He knows the truth. He heard her, what she said. And so he says in verse 7, Delilah said to Samson, Tell me where your great strength is, how we might afflict you. Uh, the cords that she mentions... Uh, Well, he mentioned, listen to verse 9. She had seen the men lying in wait in an inner room. I didn't have the verse where he said, tie me with cords. That's in there. Uh, And the the word, the cords, uh, is an animal tendon. It it was used for stringing a bow. Those are the the cords that were used. Or stringing, uh, the smaller ones, to string a harp or a guitar. In other words, they're very strong. And uh, verse 9, She had men lying in wait in an inner room. And she said to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He snapped the cords as a string of toe snaps when it touches the fire. So his strength was not discovered. And then Delilah continues, verse 10, Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you deceived me. You told me lies. Please tell me how you may be bound. We know her motive. She wants him bound. Again, he deceives her. Verse 11. He said to her, If they bind me tightly with new ropes, which have not been used, I'll become weak and be like any other man. And again, she's disappointed. Verse 12. Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson, for the men were lying in wait in the inner room. But he snapped the rope from his arms like a thread. He's playing a dangerous game. And she doesn't give up. Verse 13, Delilah said to Samson, Up to now you've deceived me and told me lies. Tell me how you may be bound. And you see, he's getting closer to the reality. He said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my hair with the web and fasten it with a pin, then I'll become weak and be like any other man. And again, she does it. And he disappoints her. Verse 14, While he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his hair and wove them into the web. And she fastened it with the pin and said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep, pulled out the pin of the loom and the web. Then she puts on the pressure. Verse 15. And she said, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You've deceived me these three times. You've not told me where your great strength is. And it came about when she pressed him daily with his, her words and urged him, his soul was annoyed to death. So you could, you could put in your own imagination and you can picture that. This time he gave her his heart. Verse 17, he told her all that was in his heart. And he said to her, a razor has never come on my head. I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaved, my strength will leave me. I will become weak and be like any other man. I'm going to just read the end of this and then 
uh, go back. Uh, Judges 16, 19 to 21. She made him sleep on her knees, called for a man, had him shave off the seven locks of his hair. Then she began to afflict him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I'll go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. That is so important a verse. He did not know the Lord had departed. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes. They brought him down to Gaza, bound him with bronze chains, and he was a grinder in the prison. Tragic end, except it's not the end. So I want to tell you the real end. But this is a very tragic story. Uh, the great tenet of our faith is there is life after death. That's what we believe. And that's not only literal, that's spiritual. And we can praise God for that. All right, that's the story. Now I say Delilah is a picture. A picture of what? And let me make this suggestion. I believe Delilah pictures this world. This world system. Delilah pictures what the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, <coughs> described in these words, Ecclesiastes 1-2, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And another place he adds, and vexation of spirit. Everything in this world is vain. The world is deceitful. I want to give you a couple of, they're not random verses, they're well chosen, but I want to give you a couple of verses that just describe the world. James 4.4 4, You adulteresses, do you not know friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And then, of course, the famous one, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. What a passage that. Now we know Satan is called the God of this world. And uh, Delilah is just picturing that. Over and over again, the Holy Spirit uses, not only uh, in Samson's story, but all through the Bible, the Holy Spirit uses the immoral woman as an illustration, a picture of the world's attempt to attract in order to destroy, to lure in order to destroy, like a fishing lure. You know, the fish sees that very colorful, attractive movement and it doesn't know that there's a hook inside. And uh, that's exactly what the world does. Listen to Proverbs 7, 21 to 23. With her many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool until an arrow pierces through his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare so he does not know that it will cost him his life. The reason I'm moved is because I know Christians who have followed that, and they didn't know, and it cost them their life. That's the story of Samson and Delilah. The world points us to this beautiful room, 
but it doesn't show us the trap door that's in that room. I think one of the most tragic pictures in all the Word of God, at least in my mind, is Samson asleep on the lap of Delilah. What a picture that is. Slowly, gradually, persistently, she draws him in until at last he's destroyed. Uh, how many times does God look down from heaven and see the Christian asleep on the lap of Delilah? Before I give the second picture, uh, I don't want to just say Delilah is a picture of the world. I want to press it home a little bit, and may God help us see this. The great tragedy is that when a person takes his eyes off the Lord, Hebrews 3.13 comes into play. Hebrews 3.13 says, So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful, and it makes you hard, and it makes you blind. Uh, Samson, as I told you last week, was playing with spiritual things. It was a game to him. It was a big riddle. He knew right from the start he was God's man, that he had been set aside by his parents, dedicated unto the Lord. And over and over again in the record, we see him presuming on the great mercy of the Lord and making a grave out of God's grace. Terrible, terrible thing. Trifling with the Holy Spirit of God. He thought it was a game he couldn't lose. Now there's sort of a paradox here because we say, well, he's being deceived, he doesn't know. He doesn't know, but he does know. Both are true at the same time. He was being deceived into believing, I know this is true, here's the deception. But it will never happen to me. It'll happen to somebody else, but it's not going to happen to me. Uh, there are those who pursue riches as a goal. And they say, I know some people would become covetous when they're just thinking about getting rich, but not me. I can handle this. That's why 1 Timothy 6, 9 is such a warning. To those who want to get rich, fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and to destruction. In the parable Jesus gave of the sower, he explained the seed that was sowed uh, among the tares. Verse 22 of Matthew 13, The one on whom seed was sown among the thorns is the man who hears the word, and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. I've known Christians who were in Samson's shoes. I have been in Samson's shoes. This idea that it's not going to happen to me. I can handle a little liquor. Come on. You don't have to say I can't handle that. I'm not going to become like the crowd that I run with. That might affect others, but not me. I can choose money without being uh, covetous. I know how far I can go. I know the limits of my passion. I'm strong. I can do it. I have willpower. A little flirting is not going to affect my marriage. I can handle this. And so gradual, so slow, so dangerous, they become harder and harder and more and more callous. They're going to learn that the world presents itself as a lover. But the world is not a lover. The world is out to kill, to steal, to destroy. Delilah says, tell me, I love you. Tell me how I can put you in bondage. Tell me how I can tie you up. The world like Delilah has sweet talk, but she's out to kill you. Listen to Proverbs 3, or rather 5, 3 to 5. 
The lips of an adulteress drip honey. Smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end, she's as bitter as wormwood. Sharp as a two-edged sword, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. May God help us know how helpless we are when our eyes are off the Lord. When our eyes are off the Lord, we are blind. We are deceitful, uh, being deceived. Uh, and we're going to end up, if we don't look back to the Lord, like Demas. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas, having loved this present world, Paul says, has deserted me. Well, that's the first picture. Delilah is a picture of this deceitful world that is out to destroy you. This deceitful world out to destroy me. Let me show you the second picture. It's really a double picture. The picture is the hair and the heart. I want to put those two together. The hair and the heart. One is external, the hair. One is internal, the heart. The hair can be seen with these eyes. The heart only God can see the intentions and the motives of the heart. Now, you know I'm using hair as a picture because that was part of the Nazarite vow. Judges 13, 5. Behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. No razor shall come upon his head. The boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he will begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistine. When Delilah finally discovered the secret of Samson's strength, Samson made the confession. And you see it in verse 17 of Judges 16. So he told her all that was in his heart. And he said, A razor has never come on my head. I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I'm shaved, my strength will leave me. And I'll become weak and be like other men. Samson knew his whole life long that his parents had dedicated him to the Lord. He knew he was a Nazareth. Now you know there were three great rules uh, for the Nazarite. Uh, no matter how short or how long their Nazarite vow was, they had to follow these three rules. Uh, Numbers chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. He shall abstain from wine, strong drink, drink no vinegar, whether made from wine or strong drink, nor shall he drink any grape juice, nor eat fresh or dried grapes. All the days of his separation, he shall not eat anything produced by the grapevine, from the seeds even to the skin. So that was the first rule, nothing from the grapevine. <coughs> The second was, of course, no, you can't cut the hair. And the third is in chapter 6, verse 6. All the days of his separation to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead person. And it was not only a dead person, it was death itself. The long hair of the Nazarite made him public. You could look at the long hair and say, here comes a Nazarite. If I saw a man walking down the street, I wouldn't know if he had raisin bran for breakfast. I wouldn't know if he put grape jelly on his toast. I wouldn't know if he kicked roadkill off his property or buried his pet, his dog or his cat, and touched death. I wouldn't know that. And so God gave us a public way to know. You could see his hair and say, here comes a Nazarite. Now, that's external. And it raises this honest question. That why is it that God waited for his hair to be cut before he left him, when God knew in his heart he had already departed from the Lord? Uh, you would think that God can see the heart and saw that he's playing a hypocrite, playing a game, and then God would depart from him. But in the story, God waits till his hair is cut. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to point out 
a very important thing that the outward symbol is important to God. It's important as a as hope, as a sign of hope. While the symbol is there, there's still hope. But if you go so far as even to throw the symbol away, uh, you've probably said your final no. Yeah, that's probably no hope. Uh, let me illustrate. Isaiah chapter 3, 9, the prophet describes the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And listen to what it says. Very interesting. The expression of their faces bears witness against them. They display their sin like Sodom. They do not even conceal it. Woe to them. Usually we think God destroyed Sodom because of sodomy, because they were perverts, because of their sexual orientation, because of their idolatry, their sin. But when did God destroy Sodom? He waited until they were public with it. And they weren't ashamed anymore. And they, they put it on display. And I believe the heart of our nation has turned from the Lord a long time ago. I really believe that. And so the question is, why hadn't God judged them yet? And I think it's because they haven't had a haircut yet. They've tried. And they're in the process of doing it. But the outward symbols seem to be still there. Uh, I know they're trying to kick prayer out of school. But in many schools, there's still prayer in the school. And they're trying to take, in God we trust, off of our flag, or our, our coins. And uh, the allegiance under God off the flag. They're trying to do that. But it's still there. It's still there. And I think that's holding back God's hand of judgment because the signs are still there. They argue about the crash, the manger. They try to get you not even to say Merry Christmas, but it's still there. Those signs, it, you still have to go to court and put your hand on a Bible and make an oath. And when you're going into a government position, you have to raise your hand, your right hand, and say, so help me God. And in many government buildings, you still have the Ten Commandments. In one case, you have Moses and the Ten Commandments pictured. But now, more and more, you have these pride parades. Uh, you're, I think you're familiar with them. By the hundreds of thousands, an LGBT pride parade. You know what? They actually call it a freedom march. And uh, it's just such a terrible thing. A gay pride and all of the rest. And they, they are making it out in the open. And they're marching. And it's immoral. And they're, they're not even dressed as they march. And, and they're mocking God as they do it. And one by one, clip, 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 the first lock, the second lock, third lock. And my heart goes out to our nation. God has already seen the heart of the nation. But she's starting to get her head shaved. And we need to really pray for our nation. Uh, anyway, that's the, the one side, the hair of the Nazarite. But there's a deeper spiritual significance. Why did God choose the hair? When he made the Nazarite vow, he could have, when trouble came, he could have done, what do they call it, a morph or whatever, and Samson grow into this green monster or something like that. He could have had many ways to do it, but he chose the hair. Let me give a couple of New Testament verses, and then I'll try to tie it together. Colossians 2.19 not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Let me just turn this down. In that passage, holding fast the head, the head is the brain. The brain is the life of the body. And everything moves. If you have a 
brain problem, you might not be able to move your arm or your leg or something like that. A stroke or so, uh, uh, MS or something like that. The head in this passage is Christ. And what the brain is to the body, Christ is to his church. And we're to hold fast the head. We see that same idea wonderfully developed. And though it's a controversial passage, it shouldn't be, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where the Holy Spirit moves back and forth from the head, the skull, the thing that sits on your neck, uh, the head, to the meaning of the head. Uh, chapter 11, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians, I want you to understand, Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of a woman. God is the head of Christ. So you got the head picturing the head. Now having said that, why did the Holy Spirit choose hair as a symbol of a separated Nazarite? Not only because it was a way to spot him in public. That's true. But the hair has a living connection to the head. The hair has a living connection to the head, like the branch to the vine. And when that connection is severed, there's a great problem, and the Lord departs. The Nazarite is separated unto the Lord as long as that living connection is maintained to the head. Judges 16, verse 19. She made him sleep on her knees and called for a man, had him shave off the seven locks of his hair. Then she began to afflict him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are on you, Samson. He awoke from his sleep and said, I'll go out as at other times and shake myself free. He did not know that the Lord had departed. When the hair was cut, the hope was gone. The living connection with the head was severed. Verse 20. He awoke from his sleep. I will go out as other time. Shake myself free. He did not know the Lord had departed. All right, hold that a moment, please. I told you that there's a double picture. The hair and the heart. Let me say a word about the heart. Judges 16.4. Can you get that? I don't think there's a handle. <laughs> let me try that. Now I'm embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me try to get that. My gosh. Oh, wow. Poor oh, Samson when you need him. What are the birds are doing? That's very clever. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I told you that we're going to move to the heart now. Judges 16.4, here's where it begins. It came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Here it starts. Now the Holy Spirit turns, he loved a woman. We didn't see that. She looks good to me, is not the same as he loved a woman. Up until this time, it's been a big game. He felt like he was God's man from the womb. Over and over again, he presumed on the mercy of the Lord. He thinks it's still a game. God's going to show him this is no longer a game. And the reason is because now your heart is involved. Your heart is involved. The Holy Spirit calls attention to it again in verse 15 of chapter 16. She said, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? The heart. After being deceived three times, Delilah goes straight to the heart. How could you say you love me? Verse 16, where she presses daily. Her words urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. Now look at verse 17. Finally, so he told her all that was in his heart. 
Delilah runs to the Philistine. And it's mentioned twice. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he told her all that was in his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up at once more. He's told me all that's in his heart. His heart is gone. He has turned his heart over to Delilah. And when you give your heart away, it's a short step for the connection, the living connection to the head to be severed. The cutting of the hair just demonstrated what had taken place inside. That's all right. Don't close it too tight. We'll all burn to death in here. Now that's the picture. The hair, the hair and the heart. The hair, the external side, the living connection to the head, the heart. The world will press you, press you, until it gets your heart. And once it gets your heart, it's over. It's over on the level of earth. Now, I'm not going to develop it now, but I get great joy out of verse 22. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaved off. What a verse that. Many a Christian has broken connection with the Lord. Fell asleep on the lap of Delilah. But by the grace of God, the hair began to grow again. I'm so thankful that the Lord, you can sever it, but you can't lose it. Now every illustration breaks down and all bald people are going to say, I'm bald, does that mean that I'm not in favor with the Lord? No, every picture breaks down. The first picture, Delilah, picture of the world. Second picture, the hair and the heart. The living connection with the head is severed. There's a third picture, let me give you that. Now to grasp this third picture, picture. I'm going to put it into a group. And I want to show you the cost illustrated by Samson. What did he lose by falling asleep on the lap of Delilah? Uh, Judges 16.20 He did not know the Lord departed. He lost the presence, at least the sensible presence of the Lord. You know, we think because we live under grace that we can never pray Psalm 5111. Psalm 5111, do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. We say the Holy Spirit's in us. He'll never take the Holy Spirit. Not in the sense of Him leaving, but as far as fellowship is concerned, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. As far as power is concerned, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You can have my eyes, but don't take the power of the Lord from me. Uh, it's It's a precious truth that's illustrated here that I can lose the visible, the sensible presence of the Lord. The sad sad thing is, of course, that Samson didn't know it. Don't answer. Would you know it if the Lord departed from you? Don't answer. Just think about it. Would you know it? Or would you still come to the Wednesday Bible studies and still go to church and still break bread and still put your name on a prayer chain and still pray for others? Would you know Are you living in such a relationship with God that if it didn't happen, if the Lord broke it, at one time, there's a story, Spurgeon almost got run over by a horse and a chariot. (laughs) Not a chariot, a carriage. A horse and a carriage. Uh, He was in England, and he stopped right in the middle of the road. And later, he was asked, why did you stop? He said, I felt a cloud come between me and my Savior. I couldn't take another step until I had that settled. He almost got run over. Are we that sensitive to the presence of the Lord? Anyway, that's one thing he lost. And then in verse 21, 
the Philistine seized him and gouged out his eyes. He lost his vision. Uh, again, he never again had to lust after the eyes, but to lose vision is to be blind to the ways of the Lord. You know how the Bible develops vision. Uh, as I come to this book under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I'm asking Him all the time for vision. Show me. I want to see Christ. If I lost that, take me home. I, I, I don't want to lose my vision. He not only lost the sensible presence of the Lord, he not only lost his vision, but verse 21, and they bound him with bronze chains. He lost his liberty. Don't just read this la la la. These are pictures. He lost the sensible presence of the Lord. He lost his vision. He lost his liberty. Uh, when we lose, break, disconnect from the Lord, from our living head. Uh, we are losers. And then in verse 21 again, he became a grinder in the prison. He also lost his dignity, his honor. It was a, the grinder uh, was given to captive slave women. Now he's the big Samson. He's known as the strong one. And they're, where's your, the secret of your strength? And now they're mocking him as he has a woman's job. And he's grinding uh, in verse 25. It happened as they were in high spirit. Call for Samson that he may amuse us. They called for Samson from the prison and he entertained them. They're mocking him. And here's this great child of God. And he's lost his honor, he's lost his dignity. He not only lost the sensible presence of the Lord, he not only lost his vision, he not only lost his liberty, he not only lost his dignity, but verse 23 and 24, the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer great sacrifice to Dagon their God, to rejoice. They said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. They said, our God has given our enemy into our hand, even the destroyer of our country who has slain many of us. It was never a battle between Israel and the Philistine. It was never about Samson. The battle was always spiritual. It was between the God of Israel and the God of the Philistine. And the God of the Philistines won. He lost his testimony. He brought shame upon the Lord. Dishonor to the name of the Lord. There's one more thing he lost. He not only lost the sense of God's presence. He not only lost his vision. He not only lost his liberty. He not only lost his dignity. He not only lost his testimony. But he was called from the womb to be God's instrument. He lost his privilege of becoming redemptive and finding his place in God's redemptive purposes. He lost his privilege. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I beg you not to look at the Samson story just as a great story in the Bible, a Sunday school story. It's an exciting story. But there's a great warning here when any Christian being lured by this world falls asleep on the lap of Delilah and has his locks shorn and a living connection is broken between him and the, the head. In every way you look at it, we're losers. All right, quickly as we close, I'm sorry I'm a little over, but I just want to get this last principle out. <coughs> Samson's hair grows back. Praise God. Again, Samson prays. Praise God. Again, he's going to learn, finally, the spiritual meaning that he never saw all his life of the Nazarite vow. I want to show you how he finally enters into the Nazarite vow. This is what God intended 
right from the start. Verse 28, chapter 16. Samson called to the Lord. This is now his hair's grown back. Now he's calling on the Lord. Please remember me. Please strengthen me this time, O God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistine for my two eyes. In verse 30, And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistine. And he bent with all his might, so the house fell on the Lord's, the people who were in it. The dead he killed at his death were more than those he killed in his life. What I want you to see is that key verse, let me die with the Philistines. This is the first time in Samson's life that he was willing to die to Samson. This dying to Samson, again, don't read this la la la, this is not suicide. This is understanding the Nazarite vow, that we have to die to ourselves. And he finally has understood it. It's as if the Lord said to him, Samson, I've been trying to teach you this all of your life. I've been trying to show you. But you've been in love with the world. You've been in love with Delilah. You've been living for yourself. You're in love with Samson. You think everything is a game. You're praying now. One last time. Please, Lord, use me. Restore me. I will, Samson. But you need to understand this. It'll cost you your life. It'll cost you your life. Samson's request to die was finally his surrender. Okay, Lord, I want to be redemptive. Now, I got led astray by verse 30 because I thought his great victory. I was focused on this. Let me die with the Philistine. And then it says, the dead he killed at his death were more than those he killed in his life. I thought his victory was how many Philistines he killed. I was counting Philistines. If you're going to understand his victory, you need to understand verses 23 and 24. The lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God. They said, our God has given Samson into our hand. Dagon, their God, it was a, it, the fish God. It was a fish with the head of a man and the hands, I mean, the head and hands of a human being and the body of a fish. They were offering sacrifices to Dagon. They were singing praises to Dagon. They were worshiping Dagon. They were glorifying him. He won the battle. Where they were gathered was not a huge civic center. That They weren't gathered in that big building. It wasn't some local restaurant that had a hall upstairs. It wasn't just some big dance hall. This was the temple of Dagon. This is where... The building where they worshipped Dagon. More than 3,000 people gathered in the temple of Dagon. And the victory of Samson in his death as a Nazarite was to bring down Dagon, their God, and to vindicate the honor of the Lord. They were saying, the battle's over, we won. And because he became a, Na a Nazarite, a heart Nazarite, the battle was not over. Now the last round. Who wins? God wins. And he then in his death brought great glory to the Lord. So the victory of his death was bringing down the temple of Dagon, not killing more numbers of Philistines. It was this idolatry. <clears throat> and uh, you know those verses where he brought down the building. Uh, let me just close with this. Job 42, you remember the end of Job? 42.10, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. The Lord increased all that Job had twofold. You look at Samson. And you say, what a loser. 
What a loser. He lost the presence of the Lord. He lost his vision, lost his liberty, lost his dignity, lost his testimony. When that building came down, I want to remind you, Samson went to heaven. Samson went to heaven. Let me ask you this. Is the presence of the Lord in heaven? He got it back. In heaven, is there any vision? <laughs> See him face to face. In heaven, is there any liberty? <laughs> any dignity? Any testimony? Any honor and glory of the Lord? He got it all back. And in his death, Samson was triumphant. All right, we're going to pick up a few strings next time in Samson, and then we're going to look toward the end of the book. Any comments or questions? Yeah. So what was the fourth picture? The fourth picture was his victory. His victory. Yeah. <clears throat> the fourth picture was his his heart that he became a heart Nazarite. Yeah. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this record of Samson. And Lord, we see these great warnings in his life. We ask you, Lord, to take not your Holy Spirit from us. You're the keeper. Keep us. We never want a living connection to our head to be severed. Work that in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name.